there's some material I thought just to have things for if you'd like to have it. Brother Frank was trying to sell my hat. <laughs> That's right. 25 cents. Nobody bought it. <laughs> That's good. The hat band on it, horse hair hat band, cost more than 25 cents. <laughs> I told him I bought that hat in Astoria, Oregon. That's where the Lewis and Clark expedition, when they went across the northern part of the country to the Pacific, that's where they landed. What? They landed in Seaside, Oregon, not Astoria. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> seaside. seaside is about 15 minutes south of Astoria. We bought the hat in Astoria, though, right? No, we bought the hat in Seaside. <laughs> okay, we bought the hat in Seaside, too. And I know. We were trying to have a wife to keep me out of trouble. We, we went sightseeing this morning, passed the road up, went up the road and saw all those chicken barns up there, and I said, well, we're in the wrong place. <laughs> well, we got to see some you know, interesting things. And, and, uh, there's a Dollar General and a bunch of chicken barns and new fences up the road. Well, we came back, and she didn't have the GPS on. Um, anyway, we got here, and you did too, praise the Lord. On the table, back, I was, I was going to say something about the table. There's a, there was, it's gone now, but there was a sign-up sheet. I don't know where it went, but uh, if you saw, there were people that signed up to be on our mailing list. The sign-up sheet's not there, so if you really want to be on the mailing list, if you, you'll have to redo it, okay? But uh, there's other things there. You sang the song, you learned the Sweet hour prayer right after you got sick. My wife, when we sing it, she said, that's a good song. Um, I was ready singing that song before I got saved we sang that song. I was part of a prayer group before I got saved. I was raised in a Methodist church. And the Methodists are very into prayer and that kind of thing. And I was for a whole year. I had a prayer partner. We met every morning. He met at his house. I met at mine. I was, I was like 14 years old, 13 years old. And uh, we had a little, read a little devotion book and prayed. You know, he knew he was praying. I knew he was praying. And did all those things. Sang that. So we sang that song pretty much every Sunday. We sang two songs in Sunday school every Sunday. One was Sweet Hour Prayer, and the other was Yield Not to Temptation, For Yielding is Sin. Each victory will help you. Some other to win. Fight manfully onward. Dark passions subdue. Look at good Jesus. He'll carry you through. <laughs> and that was what we sang as teenagers. And, you know, it didn't work very well, but it's a, good, it's, a good, it's a good song. I got saved and it made all the difference. And getting saved makes a difference in all that stuff. Amen. It's great for that. It's great to be able to remember those things. I, I, it brought back some memories to me from some of those old days. And uh, I want to talk to you. You say, I don't know if you're saying it that way, but my topic this morning, Colossians chapter 4, we're going to finish out here, is about prayer. Uh, and my topic is, con is, is continuing in prayer, so it's good that good we have the introduction about prayer. Praying is something that religious people do all over. Every religion prays. Every religion tries to talk to God. Prayer means you talk to God. And uh, you request, make a request known to God. And every religion prays, but uh, only the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ has access to the God of creation. Uh, you want to pray to the right God, and you want to pray to the right God in the right way, and you need to know what the, the, your prayer is, what it ought to be. And that's a question of the minds of people. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of things that come up when, when you talk about prayer. You see how he says in verse one, verse 2, continue in prayer. So what he's going to do after he's dealt with all the other things we've dealt with, He's going to finish the instructions with the issue of prayer. There's a real reason for that. We'll see it in just a second. Father, we thank you this morning for the weekend of fellowship around your word, for the folks who make this possible, to have a heart to uh, carry on the work of the ministry here, for Brother Frank and those that work with him, and uh, the folks that have come uh, from so many different places uh, to hear your word, be taught and edified in it. We just pray that uh, the things that we've studied this weekend might plant themselves in our hearts so that they can work in us your will as we trust them. We thank you for the privilege of it, what the high honor it is to fellowship together as members of the church, the body of Christ, and the fellowship of the mystery. And we just pray your blessings on this this morning. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Colossians 4, verse 2. Matt, oh, continue in prayer. And watch in the same with thanksgiving with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of, of Christ, for which I'm in, 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 also 
in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. And he finishes all this instructions that we've been, been, been discussing with the issue of prayer because it's the final, look at Ephesians 6, prayer is the final part of the whole armor of God. You notice how in, in Ephesians 6, he, went, he, he does the children, verse 1, verse 4, the fathers, verse 5, the servants, verse 9, the masters, just like we've been going through in Colossians. Then he lists, finally, my brethren, and he talks about the whole armor of God, the warfare that we're part of. And he comes down to verse number 17, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you notice there's a colon there. There's not a period. He isn't finishing, he isn't finished describing the whole armor. Verse number 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication and the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of all for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. There's the period. So while you have the, the whole armor of God, Starts in verse number 14. Uh, Stand therefore with your loins girt about with truth, put have them on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod in preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, uh, wherewith you'll quench all the fiery darts of the devil, of, uh, of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and taking all those armor, that, that uh, uh, armor onto yourself, spiritually speaking, the attitude with which you carry the armor, fight the fight, is praying. In other words, your mental attitude, you've got the armor on, now your mental attitude is praying all, of always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching there too. And the prayer aspect, Paul, in Colossians, he doesn't, he doesn't list all the armor, but he's, he's talking about the battle, the same fight, and he goes directly to the issue of your prayer life. So praying, the continuing in prayer is a very important aspect in, in Paul's thinking about uh, the, 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 the ministry that we have. In Colossians, it's more important than all the other, ministry, other implements of, of, the, uh, uh, of the whole armor. When we teach about the whole armor, usually we talk about all the other pieces and prayer kind of gets left out. In Paul's mind, when you talk about the warfare, the one piece of the warfare that he didn't want left out is prayer. So it's extremely important, and yet your prayer life, what I've observed about prayer, is that um, everybody prays. Very few people have any idea that their prayer life is adequate. We usually feel the inadequacy of our prayer life, and most people welcome instruction about prayer. Because we, we have a consciousness that we really don't really understand. And that's, that's kind of a strange, I've got a series of, of, of 10 hour, of, of seven, I talked years ago about prayer, because of the confusion of prayer. And that's one of the, one of the, the, the sets of, of, our, of study tapes that um, it, it is probably that and depression and the right division are probably the, the, the most I say popular, that doesn't sound right, but it's, it's the, the most requested uh, series. And prayer, because prayer is an intimate part of your life. When you study it in the, when you study it in the scripture, there are three headings that you need to study. For, you have to, to, three keys to understanding prayer. One, study it dispensationally. Because talking to God isn't the same in every dispensation. Let me show you what I mean real quick. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, most of the problem with, with prayer promises and prayer life and prayer practice is a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. Matthew chapter 22. Uh, I guess it's chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 22. In all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. 
Now that's a prayer promise you hear. Ask, you know. Pray, ask, A-S-K. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and, and you shall find. Knock, A-S-K. And, 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 and it'll be open to you, Matthew 7, 7. And when you read those things and you, and you, you try that, and in that verse, and you don't get what you ask for, the problem that verse is you're not believing. So now you're, you're praying, you don't get what you ask for, and the, the, the onus is on you, I must not be believing enough. I thought I was doing, and so now the self-doubt and the self-condemnation comes in, and you wonder why it doesn't work. Well, it's in the verse of not believing, look at 1 John chapter 3. This is the, this is the, this is the passage that when I was coming up and religion that they always use. 1 John 3. Back there in Matthew 7 and Matthew 21, why doesn't that, those instructions work in your life? And they don't. You can make out like they do. I had a book when I was, was a young believer written by a guy named John R. Rice. He was a very famous preacher back in our day. Called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. It's a book about this thick, and he talks about how every time he'd pray, it'd all come to pass. He'd pray, and he'd, he'd ask and he'd receive, ask and receive, ask and receive. How to pray like that? I get my prayers answered. Why don't you? Here, let me tell you. by my book. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I've discovered later on? It dawned on me. He only told me about the times that it worked. <laughs> he didn't tell me about the times it didn't work. That verse doesn't say there's times it won't work, times it will work. That verse says it will work. All you have to believe. That's it. Hmm. You see, preachers do that to you. First John chapter 3. By the way, you, you want to know why it didn't work? Matthew chapter 10, Christ says, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to Israel. Wow, what a concept. If you know how to write and divide the word and you understand who being spoken to, it can help you when the when the promises like that, instruction like that, that aren't written to you, you shouldn't go over and try to steal them right. and think they'll work. Right. You can't be a spiritual thief. Listen, you can go out and rob somebody and steal somebody and drive a car around for a while and not get caught, but you can't do that with God. You can't steal something belongs to somebody else and expect God to honor. First John chapter three, verse number something here, nineteen eighteen. <laughs> First John 3, 18, 9, 9, well, 18. My little children, let us not love the world, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are the truth, of the truth, and, and shall assure our hearts before him. You don't have confidence in your salvation? For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn, condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So I go ask God for something, and I don't get it. Then what's the problem? I'm not pleasing in His sight. My heart's going to condemn me. I'm not keeping his commandments. So I look around, where's it? Uh, and I, I do, I clean my, I, First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what you've got to do to get your prayers answered. And you know what the problem all that is? It just don't work. You need to be honest about it. You know why it doesn't work? Go back to, first, to, to the very first verse in First John. Look up at the heading where it says the first epistle of John. Take out your pen and by that word John, write Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. Galatians 2, 9. <clears throat> where the writer of the book of 1 John makes an agreement with the Apostle Paul that he, John, would go to the circumcision and Paul would go to the uncircumcision. So if he made an agreement in Acts 15 with the Apostle Paul, shook his hand and said, I'm going to restrict my ministry to the circumcision, the little flock in Israel. Who do you think he wrote 1 John to? Israel. Paul's going to go to the circumcision, the uncircumcision, that's us. John didn't think he wrote this book to you. Why do you think he did? 
I'm not such a question. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't write it to you, then he wasn't telling you that's prayer instructions for you. <laughs> so the first thing you find is that the, the major problem with, with prayer practice and prayer promises today is a failure to write and divide the word, a failure to go to the right place in the Bible to get it. By the way, we sang that song about that last verse about you know going home out pigskin and the lofty height looking at you. Know what that, you know, do you know the scripture reference to that? Yeah. That's Moses. He didn't get to go in the promised land. Remember that? Right. Went up on Mount Pitch, it, got to see into it. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's the, the good old all-millennial idea about the promised land was heaven. Wasn't heaven. And Moses is looking into heaven. Well, I understand the, the, the symbolism, and, and we can sing the song and, and be touched by it, and that's great. But that's really not Bible. But people do that. <clears throat> Prayer promises and prayer practice needs to be considered and understood dispensationally. Get in the right place. Then you need to understand it doctrinally. What does Paul teach about prayer? What is how how are we supposed to pray in the dispensation of grace? What's what's the Paul in practice? <clears throat> and then you consider it devotionally about how that works in your life, the practical application of it in my life, how, how it would help me as I function in life. So understanding how to pray with Paul is extremely important. And Colossians 4 ends with the instruction to, to do that. We're to be praying, continuing in prayer, and watching there in the same with thanksgiving. When you continue in prayer, it's easy to give up on it. If, if you think you're, if you, if you're expecting something that God isn't going to do, you can't make God do something he isn't doing. Amen. Get over that. Amen. I, I've said it for years. You'll never be big enough a day in your life to make God do something he's not doing. He knows what he's doing. What you need to do is find out what he's doing and do that. You figure out from the word of God what God's doing today. You go do what God's doing. You'll be doing the will of God. Because you're doing what God's doing. How did you know that? You found it in the word of God and rightly divine. Don't make it up. Don't let some religious teacher come along and just grab anything out of the way. Understand God's word rightly divided. That's what God's doing today. And then just go practice that. Just go do what God's doing. And don't quit. Now your flesh will want to quit. Your circumstances will make you want to quit. Continue. Endure. Keep going. Watch in the same. Pay attention. Look around you. Guard against divert, being diverted off. Away from what, what you're doing. And then it says, with thanksgiving. <coughs> Thess uh, Colossians has repeatedly, Paul talks about thanksgiving, 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 thanksgiving. He says more about forgiveness in Colossians than any other of his books. He says more about thanksgiving. <coughs> just being grateful to God. And that's the attitude that you pray with. You talk to God out of, just out of the gratitude of his grace. Continue in prayer. Watch the, in the same with thanksgiving. Then he's going to tell you in verse 3 some instructions about what, how he wants you to pray. Here's some instructions about the, the, the effect. Verse 2 talks how to be effective. Verse 3 is going to talk to you about uh, uh, when, you, when you're praying, here's some things. Here's, here's your prayer list. With all, praying also for us. Pray for, you, pray for the spiritual leaders. Pray for people who are out on the front lines in the ministry and the conflict. Brother Frank's talking about praying for the you, you, you pray for the leaders not because you're trying to get them to do something for you, because you know they're in the conflict and there's opportunity to, to support them and think about them and talk about them to, to God about those things. You pray for your, your pastor. You pray for Bible teachers. You pray for people in the mission field. You pray for your, 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 uh, your mom and your dad leading at homes. You pray for teenagers that leading in, in school. You pray for future leaders like pray for us, pray for leaders think about that don't just don't just pray for your you know your ingrown toenail you know what you do with an ingrown toenail go to the doctor okay understand, you understand what I'm saying when you have a physical problem what do you do go get the guy that fixes physical problems my car has a flat tire. I don't say, oh, God, keep me from a flat tire. Fix that flat tire. I take it down to the guy that fixes tires. <laughs> Why? Because that's who fixes tires. <laughs> I mean, 
You just have to use common sense. Pray for us. Now watch. That God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, which I am also in bonds. Now when he says that God would open a door of utterance, you've you got, you got to get the... Almost, I'm almost said what I'll say. You, you got to get religion out of your mind here. One of the most superstitious issues in your life will be your prayer life. Amen. Because you, you, frankly, you, 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 instead of focusing your, your your thinking and talking to God based on what His Word says, you to focus your, your thinking and talking to God about what you think God was doing, what you want Him to do. And it gets to be just a bunch of superstitious kind of poodle do. People come to that verse and they say, well, you see, pray that God would open up a bunch of doors of, of, of opportunity. He would take, a, he'd take circumstances and move them around here and, and, and do kind of thing so that he'd get a chance to speak. He, he didn't say open a door of circumstances. He said open a door of utterance that he may speak. The issue is talking. Paul said, I want opportunity to, to preach the gospel. And it was just open doors. That's talking about the open an get, get, get an opportunity to preach, get an opportunity to, to, to speak, um, to, 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 to do something. And you can look at all kinds of times, like I won't look at, you can look at all kinds of verses where, where he talks about that. But people, people do, do this in a, in, in a, in a, a Calvinistic intervention kind of control way. That I did God's control in all the circumstances of life. There's no time and chance happened to all men. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? That that kind of questions what, what people with the God control. You understand if God controls every event, what are you worried about? Just go do what you want to do because you, that's what you, you already decided to do that. Right? It, it just it's kind of a kind of a devilish kind of an idea. But God is doing something. He controls what He's doing. One of the but look with me Revelation chapter three. I mean, in my mind I'm trying to I look at the clock and I'm trying to think about some of these verses that use as illustration. Revelation chapter three, verse number seven. The church of Philadelphia. And this is this is a church that will exist in the seventh week in, in the in the tribulation period in the future. And the angel of the church of Philadelphia uh, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Now, the key of David, what do you think? What do you think the key of David would what, what door would that open up? Well, if you look at Isaiah 22, you'll see the key of David opens up the kingdom. He's the, he's the, the king. And the key of David, I'm giving to you the key that's going to get you into the kingdom. Is the idea there. Verse 3, verse 8, I'm sorry. And I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my, my name. You'll hear preachers say, God has set before us this open door, and David, I think, was yesterday talking about He's, let, he, he's speaking to us and leading us to build a $2 million building. And because of, he said, you're not doing any of that. It's not God opening a door for you to do something. That's talking about these people in the tribulation. He's opened the door to the kingdom. Here's the door for you to get into the kingdom. How do I know that? The verse tells me, the verse before, what the key, what the key is. It's the key of David. The key to open the door to get into the kingdom. And he's opened the door the opportunity for them to get into the kingdom. Nobody's going to stop that. That's a program that's in operation. <coughs> Another way people do it is, well, what we need to do is, we need to prayerfully put out the fleece, find out what God wants us to do. You ever heard of that? Yes. You shake your head yes because you know you have. I want you, I want you to see how crazy this is. Look, look back at Judges, chapter number six. I call this fleecing God. <laughs> In Judges, chapter six, Gideon. Gideon is one of the craziest characters, characters, one of the craziest judges in Israel. Judges chapter 6. God tells Gideon, 
verse number 12, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Seven times in the text here, the angel says, The Lord's with you. Five times he says, The Lord wants you to do this. So you get down to verse number 36. Gideon says unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, watch, as thou hast said. Did God tell Gideon he's going to deliver Israel by his hand? Gideon said he did. Twelve times he says it in, in the verses before this. Gideon says, if you said that, if you really meant that. And he, he, behold, and this is fascinating. Behold, I, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor. And if the dew on the fleece, if, if, the, if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth, besides, then shall I know that thou will save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. You saying it's not enough. <laughs> I got the circumstantial <laughs> confirmation. And if it be so, verse 8, 38, and, and it was so, I'm sorry. So he, for he rose up early on the morning and thrust the fleece together and wringed the, the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Bless God, I now know. No, let, thy, let thine anger be not, be, be hot, let not thine anger be hot against me. And I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and upon all the ground there be dew. And God did so. Now you talk about the patience of God. If you had a kid and you told him to do something, he back talk to you twice that way. <laughs> well, if it had been one of my boys, he, he, would have, he would have been sitting down for a while. But God's patient with Gideon. Because Gideon is, is full of nothing but doubt. You go back to verse 12. The angel says, The Lord is, is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with thee. He starts out doubting. Yeah. Putting out the fleece isn't believing, it's doubting. Amen. We're trying to find out whether God really wants us to do this. Where are you going to find that out? He said, does God want you to do it? Give me a verse. Show me the verse. Tell me the verse. He said, well, we put out the fleece. When Gideon put out the fleece, he was, he was actually challenging the Abrahamic covenant. Gideon knows what God's word. When he says, you see verse 37, I will put... Uh, a fleece of wool on the floor. Where do you get wool? You get wool out of, of a sheep. Who are the sheep represented in the Bible? The nation of Israel are sheep. Book of Psalms over and over. So he takes a he takes a, a, a some wool off a sheep. He takes a little flock of Israel, and he says, "I'm going to put them out there, and you put the water on them, and nobody else." Who's God going to bless the world through Israel? Who's his people? Israel, not the Gentiles. Then he says, well, next time, I want you to take the, the I'm going to put the fleece out there, and don't put any water on it, put it, take it out of the fleece, out of Israel, and put it among the Gentiles. He said, I'm going to bless you, and then I'm going to bless the nations through you. So Gideon understood first that the blessing had to be, belong to Israel only, but then he's going to bless the, the Gentiles through Israel, out of Israel. No. Gideon understood the program, but he just didn't believe it. And when God spoke to him, and the whole issue of the, the fleecing, the putting out the fleece, when you hear preachers talk, we put the fleece out, we tested God, uh, looking for circumstances to confirm a decision. That God said, look, you look to the word of God. Circumstances are not where God's word is revealed. Amen. They're not where his will is revealed. They're not where his purpose and path in your life is revealed. Amen. His purpose, his path for your life, his will for your life is written in his word. Amen. He spoke it. Everything you ever need to know about everything God has for you to do is in that book. Your problem is you don't get in the book enough. You're dreaming things. Listen, quit doing all the circuit. You get the will of God out of His Word, 
You go do His will in your life. Your, your, your life is a stage on which you live. That's the context, that's the stage, that's the circumstance in which you go do the will of God, not where you discover it. Religion has that backwards because they don't know what God says. That's right. You understand what, what this is? So when your prayer life, you're not saying, Lord, show me out there what you want me to do. In your prayer life, you're taking God's word, and you see there in Colossians 4, what he says in, 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 in verse 5, walk in what? Wisdom. Where are you going to get the wisdom from? Go back to chapter 1. That you be filled with, with knowledge and wisdom and all spiritual understanding. You get the wisdom out of the Word of God. And then you go walk in that wisdom and you talk to God about, the, here's what the wisdom is, here's what it says, understand the Word of God. Here it is, how do I then take that wisdom that God has given me in His Word and go live that in the circumstances that I live in? How do I apply God's Word? Your prayer life is designed... For you to communicate and commune with your heavenly Father personally. Ephesians 2 verse 18 is one of the greatest verses in the Bible to me. Three times Paul uses the term access. <laughs> That's a great word, especially in the computer age. My dear wife has a computer that she works with at her desk, and, and I don't think she ever sits at it that she doesn't start yelling at it <laughs> because it, she can't get to something. You turn it on, and the program doesn't come up. The program comes up, and the place you want to go doesn't work. And what it is, is you, you can't get access. You know the information is there, but you can't get access to it. But you can't get access by beating on the, on, on, on the, on the desk or yelling at your husband either. <laughs> at least that's what I tell her. But what do you need? You need to know the key to punch access to God. Being justified by faith. We're at peace with God. When we have access into this grace when we stand. You've got access to God's grace. In God. <coughs> Ephesians 2.18 he says, in him. Look at 2.18. I, I get convicted when I start quoting verses. You know, I minister, we don't put verses on the wall. Um, we made a decision not to do that. Because when you put verses on the wall for people to watch, you know what you do? You quit looking at your Bible. Mm -hmm. I've been places where they, where they put the word the verse in the Bible, people didn't bring their Bible. Mm -hmm. well, the verse on the wall. When you when you just look at a verse on the wall, I can put you watch on you watch guys in the video do this. And they deceive people. Amen. Because you just string verses together on the wall, and people just look at the verses and you put them all together on the wall and they oh, look, look like what it says. But if they had been looking at their Bible and seen the book and the, the, on, and the t context and the verses around it, they wouldn't have been deceived quite so fast. You need to look at verses. And I get convicted because there's seven verses I want to talk about and I'll just start quoting them. <coughs> but that's not a whole lot different than just putting them on the wall. I want you to look at them. This is important enough to look at. Ephesians 2 verse 18. For through him, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father. That's the whole Godhead. It's on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ that you can have access to the Father. But it's through the ministry, it's by the one spirit. It's, it, it's as though God the Holy Spirit comes and takes you by the hand, walks you across the blood of Christ into the presence of the Father and says, here they are, Dad. Here, here's the Father. Well, how does the Holy Spirit do that? Well, he doesn't get you by the hand and take you across because that's not how it works. How does the Holy Spirit do that? By, well, look, look back at Romans 5, verse 2. How does the Holy Spirit work in your life? You see, when we talk about these things, it's, it's, that's why it's important to understand how the Spirit of God works in your life through his word. <laughs> you want the Spirit of God to work in your life? It's the book. It seems to me like I'm saying this all the time, but in you, when you start reading the first work, chapter of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth is without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the Spirit of God, Genesis 1-2, wanted to move in His creation. What did He do? 
Verse 3, and he said. Three verses in the Bible, God shows you how the Spirit of God works in his creation. He speaks. He works through his word. That's always the way it works. If God, the Holy Spirit, is going to work in your life, it'll be through that book. Through the truth of his word. When he works, that's how he works. He's not out there in circumstances of manipulating things around so that, oh, that's what God wants me to do. You know, the guy on TV says what you need to do. First, you need to get in the book and read, read the Bible. That won't be enough for you. So then you need to look for circumstances. Look for signposts. Look for feelings and hunches to tell you that that must be God. Oh, that must be God working. How do I know? I'll put a fleece up. Fine. You know what you did? You know what you're doing? You're, you're operating in unbelief. According to Judges chapter 6, for example. Why, why did he put a fleece out? He didn't believe what God said. He's looking for the will of God outside the word of God. That's called unbelief. That's called if. When God works, God the Holy Spirit works, he can give you access to the Father. It'll be on the basis of the blood of Christ. It'll be by means of his word. Amen. Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access, how? By faith. So where does faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by <coughs> the word of God. So you have access by your faith in God's word to you into the grace when you stand. All grace is all that God is free to do for you through the finished work of Christ. You have access to bring those things into your experience. How? By your faith in God's word. Amen. So when you're going to be praying, you're having access. You're practicing Ephesians 2 18. <clears throat> on the basis of the blood of Christ. Not on the basis of anything you do, anything you deserve, but based on who He's made you in His Son. And who is Christ? You're accepted in the Beloved. The Father says, You're my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. I'm happy you're here. Come see me. He doesn't say, Oh, there's stuff in your life I'm not going to let you in for. <laughs> you know why that is? The cross took care of that. You'll be conscious of the fact there's always stuff in your life you shouldn't be let in for. Because there is. But what took care of that? That's what the cross took care of. So it's through him. It's based on him, based on who he's made you in Christ, that you get access to the Father. And the Holy Spirit's the one, and I use the illustration, take you by the hand and walk in, he makes it real in your life. How? By your faith in the truth of his word. So when you're praying, your prayer life has to be based upon an understanding of God's word right to divide it. If you try to pray like Israel prays, you ain't Israel. Jesus told his apostles, his disciples, he says, when you pray, don't pray like the heathen pray. How do they pray? They say they're going to be heard because they're not speaking. Let's get everybody praying for us. You know, I've heard missionaries all my life say, we just need everybody praying for us. More people pray for us, the more power we have in the midst. That's nonsense. How do I know? That's what Jesus said. He said, if you want to pray like the heathen, thinking he did, the more people get praying, the more power you have with God. That's what the heathen think. Don't pray like that. So quit praying like the heathen. And quit praying like Israel. Our Father the chart in heaven, how would we let it back? Don't pray like Israel. Pray like the body of Christ. Amen. Who are you? You're somebody based upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, 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 look. Go back to Ephesians, chapter 3. That other access term. And I'm going to tell you, this is not anything that I had in my notes to talk about. <laughs> so this must be the leading of God. <laughs> now this is just a feeble mind that can't remember what he, what he wrote down and, and, and looks at his notes and can't read the music because they're too small. <laughs> and I left my, I left my magnifier in my briefcase. <laughs> I've always preached extemporaneously. I never preached. I, I have friends that read, can read, just read everything they say. I can't do that. If I if I wrote down a sheet of paper, you know, notes, it takes me six weeks to, read, to preach it. I read a phrase and it, it tells me something I want to talk about. But you, you put the word in your heart, and then you, you kind of get up. You do organize something. And I'm trying to let the verses organize this. I'm trying to get on with it. Verse number <laughs> 12, Ephesians 3.12. In whom? Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 11. We have boldness and access with confidence. 
by the faith of him. You can come boldly into the presence of the Father because you have access. Why? Because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing. You can... Every thought that you have, your Father hears it. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Continue in prayer, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean, Lord, I'm just going to talk to you about this thing. Right? Okay. It doesn't mean bow your head and close your eyes. If you drive your car right where I live, you do a lot of prayer. <laughs> but you got to keep your eyes open. You understand? It, it, it's not it's not the religious stuff. Prayer, talking to God, in your conscious thinking, you hear yourself, and He hears you. So if He hears everything you say, why would you say, "Well, Lord, now I'm going to talk to you." Well, now I'm not talking to you. If He hears it all. When you become conscious of that kind of communion that you have with the Father, you realize that all of your thinking is done in His presence. So why not consciously let all of your thinking be a conversation with Him? You know what that'll do? When that dude cuts you off in that car and you want to go, <laughs> you say, Father, I want to. Well, oh, wait a minute, maybe I don't. I'm talking to the Father. Maybe I should have this attitude about it. It's a, it's a conscious kind of thing that's a wonderful thing. And when you learn to have that kind of constant communion, constant access, you have it. When you bring that into your consciousness and your thinking, now you realize that everything I'm thinking, I can, instead of thinking over here, I can think this, in the, I'm thinking this in the presence of the Father. So I need to think about it as I'm talking to the Father. And now all of my consciousness and all of my thinking internally is really becomes communion with my Father. And when that happens, you'll understand how to pray without ceasing. That is, all of your thinking, all of your internalizing thoughts, I'm having them with my Father. Now, if you start, you understand how that will be a corrective? Because sometimes your internalized thoughts, the flesh get them, they start talking, and then your conscience says, Father, I'm going to talk to you about what my flesh is saying. And what are you supposed to do with the flesh? What did God do with it? Crucify the flesh with the lust and affections thereof. You're free from that. You're forgiven and you're free. And you're talking to the Father like you're a slave? Well, there's, a, there's an instant correction that comes into your thinking. That's how the scripture begins to correct and instruct. But there's this, what I'm talking to you about, your prayer life is a, is a, is a it's not a, I'm doing it over here and over You can do it over here and do it over there, especially if you do it with other people, because nobody else can hear what's going on inside. If you're going to pray with audibly so other people can hear it, that has to be a, a moment and a moment. But Frank's talking about praying in the morning and in the evening. But I guarantee he prays all day long, internally. But he can't do it all day long with his wife or with you. So there's, there's the outward expression of it. But that simply needs to be the outward expression of something that's going on continually internally. So you continue in that. And when you pray, you pray that God would give you opportunities to preach the word as you ought to speak. And that's not, a, that's not an issue of him opening a door of, of circumstances. That's him, you in, wherever you are in whatever circumstances you're in, taking advantage of the opportunity to speak. My wife gets a little upset at me. I, we were in the hotel, one of the elevators. I start talking down the elevator. And, you know, people look at you a little strange. This part of the world, they don't do it quite so much. Right where we live, if you, People's got the guard up. <laughs> but you know, it, you, you can discover that, that you, and you take advantage of the opportunity. Then he says in verse 5, walk in wisdom. Let your, let your walk, your, your path through life, back up. 
your prayer life. Let, 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 let what you're, you're, you're doing in, in, your, in, in your walk substantiate your, your internal life. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. That, that's a great expression, them that are without. How many of those on the outside? But the people on the outside are without. And if you're without money, you don't have it. They don't have the blessings you have. They're outside of Christ. You don't walk in wisdom. The way you walk in wisdom, you go back to chapter 1, verse number 9. You see verse 3 where it says, we, 1, 3, we give thanks to God. He starts the book off thanking God, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father. Everything he's going to do, he's just giving thanks to God for everything God's done. So verse 9, he says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And the desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He wants you to be gripped and controlled by an understanding, a knowledge of his will, a knowledge of his grace and his love to you in Christ. Why? That you may walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Your walk comes out of your being. It comes out of who you are in Christ. Who do you be? You're just living like who you really are in Christ. And you're walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and so forth. Where does that come from? You're filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom, spiritual understanding. So he says, walk in wisdom. Walk in all this understanding of who you are in Christ. And walk that way toward those that are without, redeeming the time, taking advantage of the opportunity. He's not talking about going out and chewing them out. He's not talking about, he's talking about when you, when you deal with the people in the world, deal with them from, from God's perspective, not the world's perspective. And you walk in wisdom toward them which are without. That, listen, redeeming the time. It would do more for your world to do that than anything else you'll do. It'll do more than, than being a part of political organizations, whatever. Walking in wisdom toward those that are without. That's how you redeem the time. Verse 6, it says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Now the way your speech is, is, is with grace, if you look at Ephesians 4, verse 29, <laughs> you know, Dave's talking about the way people make money. And, you know, everything you need to know the dispensation of grace about making money is in, in, in Ephesians 4, verse 8. And if you took that approach to life, all the, all the masters and the, and the money makers, the world will be so much different. <clears throat> Let him that stole steal no more. Don't be a thief. But rather, let him let. You, you know, this is, the, the, the joke in this verse is people say well, the punctuation, there's no punctuation in, in Greek language, so the punctuation in English is stuck in there. You can change it around. You better not change it in this verse. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands. You move the punctuation around and you make it say, let him that steal, let him that, that, that stole steal. No more let him labor with his hands. <laughs> Leave the punctuation alone. Why? But he work. Work with his hands the thing which is good. Why? That he may have to give to him that needed. Not that he might have everything he wants to have, buy and buy and buy and on and on and on, but that he, that he might have. He's got his needs met, his family's needs met, and then he's got stuff to give to other people to help meet their needs. That's an entirely different attitude about money, life, and war. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. That's how you have your speech with grace. Words are going to edify, build up, not tear down. That minister grace to the hearers. Let your speech be always with grace. No, pro, no, no, no damage in conversation. Season with salt. I like that one. That you, may, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. That thing about being seasoned with salt. We, we ate supper last night at my wife's, one of her favorite restaurants. Now, Cracker Barrel. 
Come back with him, book of Job. Get Job in one hand and, and Leviticus in, in one hand. And they, they, they bring out the, the food. And Dave said he was bragging about having more than one first date earlier. <laughs> All right, I looked at my wife and said, how many first dates did I have? She said, one. <laughs> I, I chased her until she caught me. <laughs> I can get away with this when I'm up here. <laughs> they told me years ago that uh, I, I had a friend, he, he, he hired people in, in his company. And he said one thing she did was take them to lunch. They interviewed him to take them to lunch. And what he watched was when the food came, if they salted their food before they tasted it, he wouldn't hire them. Because you don't know if it's salted enough, if it's adequate. Taste it to see if it needs salt, and then salt it. And I thought, well, that was kind of a weird thing, but I took that, I kept that in mind, and I practiced that in my own life. Well, taste it before you salt it. You salt, don't just add on. Because salt adds flavor. That's his purpose. Job chapter 6, verse 6. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? The idea is you need to add the salt so you can make it palatable to eat. So when he says, let your conversation be with great season with salt, he sort of adds some flavor to, the, to grace so that it's palatable to eat. But the fascinating thing about Saul, come back to Leviticus chapter 2. The Apostle Paul was a rabbinical scholar. He was a, uh, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, the, 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 the famous, did you know that Gamaliel, <coughs> the rabbinical scholar of the first century, is still re revered by Jew Jews today? The Chicago Temple. In Chicago, we have a man in our, we have three different Jewish believers in our assembly. And one of them, his mother is still in that, that uh, temple down there. And uh, he's made opportunity for me to, to meet some of the rabbis down there. One young, younger rabbi, about 35 years old, actually, I spent hours with him. Uh, he was interested in Leviticus 26 and the history of Israel and, and things. And had, had the opportunity to meet these people. And it's fascinating to, to see. He was very respectful of the Apostle Paul. He said he was trained by one of our leading lights in Judaism today. So they, today they still, they still honor the man. When Paul would use a strange thing like have you come say season with salt, in his mind, that Jewish mind, that, that, that meant something. When you read your Old Testament, it's a fascinating thing to see something like Leviticus chapter 2, which is, is an offering that the Apostle Paul has been very familiar with. And when, when, uh, when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, and by the way, the word meat there, it's not flesh. You're going to read it, it's, it's, it's uh, going to be grain, meal. But the word meat, and people say, I see you can do it, Bob, doesn't have to talk about it. You ever eat an apple and talk about eating the meat of the apple? <laughs> any, any food that has an edible part to it is meat. Back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, the very first time it shows up, it's not, they're not eating animal meat, meat, they're eating vegetation. So if you let your Bible define the words instead of your you know, scribble mind, you don't have problems with these things. When any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and, and he shall pour out oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. And he goes on down to describe this meat. I'm not going to go through all the verses there. What I want you to see is verse 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering, with all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. So the salt was put on it to magnify 
the, 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 the flavor of, the, of the, 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 the meal, the different things. And he lists a bunch of things. What does, the, what does this meat offering represent in the typology? It represents the, you, you see how he talks about everything's going to be pure, fine flour, pour the oil, frankincense. If you go down through verse 2, 3, 4, and 5, if we, if we had an hour to do that, what you would discover is this meat offering, this meal offering, this fine flour offering, is a picture of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the value that God sees in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how he's concerned. And then you take salt and you magnify the flavor. You're magnifying the value of that offering. Did I suggest to you that when Paul says that you have your conversation with grace seasoned with salt, he's saying your conversation needs to be about the Lord Jesus Christ and all that God provides for you and him, and you need to be magnifying him in your conversation with people. Make him the issue in life. Make him everything. That's the way you answer every man. When you answer people, don't try to argue all the things you know or that you don't know. Just point them to him. Make him everything. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how, to answer, or how you ought to answer every man. The answer for every man's question is, the, is found in the magnifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in his grace to us in him and making that everything. So when you continue in prayer with Paul, make, make it all about him. Don't look out through the circumstances and say, what are you trying to teach me? Look in your word and say, what does your word say about those circumstances and how to live in them? And in it, make everything about the Lord Jesus Christ. As you do that, what you become in your walk, people look at you, and then there, that's where Christ is all. I, I quoted a poem yesterday, it's actually a song that meant a lot to me in my early Christian life. I saw the martyr at the stake. The flame could not his courage take, nor death his soul of all. He looked triumphantly to heaven. I, I asked him once his strength was given. He looked triumphantly to heaven and said, Christ is all. And I tell you, that's what that's all the Christian life is. Christ is all. Magnify him. Let him be your all in all. Paul said, for to me, the way I look at life, is, it's for me to live as Christ. Why? I want verse before that. For me to live. What's it? I'm explaining verse 20, Philippians 1, that Christ might be magnified in my body or my life of death. For to me, life is having him magnified. Your great, your speech of great with grace, season with soul. So when you leave here, you go back out in the world, you're up on the mountaintop here. <laughs> and boys in one. Don't have cell service up here. We, I saw, I saw an ad this morning. A restaurant offered 10% discount on, on the meal if you did use your cell phone. Think about that. You sit at the restaurant, instead of talking to your wife or your kids or who you're with, what you doing? They offer 10%. I thought, that's, that's a woman. <laughs> so you go back to life, don't worry about your cell phone, just, just make Christ everything. <laughs> and continue in prayer. Let your mental attitude, your thinking process, continuously be before the Father because of the Son. Who? The Spirit. Okay? Father, we thank you this morning for your loving and grace, for the privilege we have of calling your Father for the high honor that you give us to love you because you first loved us. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.